and welcome to the Max Medical Symposium for Medical and Health Professionals. The focus of today's symposium is the immune system and immune system regulation. My name is Bobby Horn, and it is my honor and pleasure to serve as your host for today. I've known both of our presenters for over 10 years, and I'm delighted they both said yes when they were invited to participate in this symposium. This is the first in a series of Max Medical Symposiums. Our goal is to provide medical and health professionals with a higher understanding of the connection between nutritional science, genetics, and human disease, and how we can bridge the gap. Our first presenter is Dr. Margaret Smith, known to her friends as Margie. Dr. Smith is a molecular geneticist with over 30 years' experience in neurogenetics and cancer genetics. She has worked in major teaching hospitals in both New Zealand and Australia, where she works specifically with families affected by early-onset Alzheimer's disease, in addition to conducting diagnostic screening for heritable breast and ovarian cancers. Working with the American-based company Transgenomics, Dr. Smith established high throughout genetic analysis using WAVE technology. This enabled breast cancer screening to be used in diagnostic laboratories in Australia, New Zealand, and Canada. Dr. Smith's work has been published in the areas of both cancer and neurogenetics. In 2009, Dr. Smith became the founder of a nutritional genomics company called Smart DNA. This company has established affordable, predictive, and preventive nutrition-based genetic testing for practitioners and their patients to facilitate personalized nutrition profiling and counseling. In 2014, Smart DNA developed a smart gut test to evaluate the human microbiome, in addition to developing the first curated human microbiome database in Australia for researchers and commercial entities alike. In 2009, Smart DNA established Smart Lab which offers a range of services from DNA extractions, genomic analysis, clinical trials, bioinformatics, product validation, research, and development. Dr. Smith was approached by Harlequin Publishing to write a book on personalized medicine and nutritional genomics for the general public. Her book, called Gene Genius, was published in September 2015. It is my great pleasure to welcome and introduce you to my friend, Dr. Margie Smith. Margie? Bobby, thank you so much for that introduction. Uh, And uh, I'm going to present today on nutritional immune omics, one size doesn't fit all. So we're really focused on immune health today. So a little pertinent piece for you all to remember as we go through this presentation today, everything that we eat, drink, inhale, even what we think about, absorb or expose ourselves to has a molecular consequence. It interacts with our DNA. And that's at quite a personal level because our DNA and the way it's composed is unique for each individual. So the topics we're going to cover today are gut health. I thought I would start off with that, looking at gut health in terms of our immune system, nutrition, and then a particular piece around people that may be FUT2 non-secretors and that how that affects immune health, specifically for those individuals. We're going to talk about our glutathione enzymes and in particular how that relates to our immune system. And then we're going to finish off by looking at cardiovascular health. I'm going to help you to understand some of the genetics, nutritional pieces, how we can use antioxidant support to protect our cardiovascular health and then also our immune system. So let's get started. So here we go, gut health. So approximately 80% of your immune system is in your gut. So it's really important that we protect our gut and we understand how to make the most of our gut health. So the gut microbial ecosystem That consists of over 10 trillion microbial cells, and it's the primary source of thousands of small molecules and other bioactive compounds that can trigger both host, metabolic, and immune pathways. So, wow, that means that this microbial ecosystem has a life of its own, and it can dictate, in a way, 
what our overall health looks like. And as such, the gut microbial um, ecosystem has been implicated in the development of many chronic and systemic diseases, including inflammatory bowel disease, metabolic diseases such as type 2 diabetes and neurological disorders. So this is an area that we can really focus on and learn how to basically manipulate our gut microbiome for health. And here's a really easy way to understand the impact of our dietary intake on our gut health. So this is one way that we can indeed be master manipulators of our gut microbiome. So if we look at two styles of eating, people predominantly eating plant protein or people eating predominantly animal protein. Now nutrition, it dictates 50% of what our gut microbiome looks like. So if you want to protect your immune health and your gut health, then diet is one very, very simple way that you can control what your gut microbiome looks like. So if you're eating a predominantly plant-based diet, then what we know is that you increase probiotic bacteria, these wonderful probiotic bacteria, bifidobacterium and lactobacillus species. And what they do is they produce short-chain fatty acids. So these are metabolites that in some respects, help to control inflammation. So they reduce inflammation in the gut microbiome, which is fantastic. They also reduce inflammation in our body systemically. It improves the gut barrier. Now, why is that important? Because if you have a really healthy gut barrier, it means that toxins and other nasty metabolites produced by bacteria won't end up in our bloodstream and circulate through our body and also improves Tregs, and Tregs are regulatory T cells that are critical for regulating intestinal inflammation. So that's fantastic. And at the same time, when you're eating this plant-based diet, it pushes down bacteroides and clostridium perfringens. And now why is that so important? Well, if you're eating animal protein and a high fat diet, you'll see now conversely, these bacteroides are pushed up. Bacteroides predominantly eat a lot of carbohydrate material, but they also turn bodies into sugar factories. So elevated levels of bacteroides correlate with elevated levels of blood sugar. So people with type 2 diabetes often have these elevated levels of bacteroides. So flipping over to eating a more plant-based diet will start to suppress these bacteria. Remember, it's a finite system. It's not necessarily about trying to use um, agents to suppress these bacteria. If you change your diet, you'll simply suppress some of these bacteria and allow the other bacteria to flourish. Now, the important piece here also is that uh, one of the probiotic bacteria, bifidobacterium, is suppressed here, and we get a redu reduction of short-chain fatty acids. Now, that's not a good thing because, it, once again, it means that we are pushing up inflammation. And it also increases levels of a chemical called TMAO, and that has been implicated in cardiovascular disease. So I know most of us sit somewhere in the middle of this animal and plant-based protein, but if you want to reduce inflammation and you want to have a say in what your gut microbiome looks like, then maybe skewing to more towards a plant-based diet is going to be really, really helpful in terms of being the master manipulator of what your gut looks like. Now, here's another interesting piece. The gut microbiome is connected to so many parts of our body and it's also connected to the lung, the lung. So it's called the gut microbiome lung axis. It's not new and it's uh, been proposed that the development of certain respiratory conditions, um, including COVID-19, it can actually affect the gut microbiome. We know that people with uh, poor immune responses can often have a gut upset uh, when it comes to uh, viruses and in particular gut uh, COVID-19 with gut health. So it, uh, it makes it an interesting target uh, for the disease management of uh, COVID-19. So it's really important we look after our gut health and also our immune health when it comes to 
being in the middle of this COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and there have been two large studies reported the efficacy of probiotics in reducing the incidence and duration of viral respiratory infections. So here we go. So using probiotics can be very helpful in manipulating the gut, which then in turn produces these uh, products or metabolites that can assist our lungs when it comes to uh, being infected with uh, various viral viruses. So very important to remember that by looking after the gut microbiome using probiotics uh, potentially can help with the management and reduce uh, the duration of viral respiratory infections. Now here's another interesting piece around the um, FUT2 uh, genotype. Now, 20% of people are called FUT2 non-secretors, and that's based on a particular genotype within the FUT2 gene. Now, why is this important? It's important because if you are a non-secretor, it means that there's a greater vulnerability and susceptibility to viral infections. So what can we actually do about this? Well, one of the most important pieces around this is to uh, look at our diet and in particular improve our fiber intake. We also don't secrete human milk oligosaccharides. And that may be another important piece to look at is the um, supplementation with uh, human milk oligosaccharides because without those, we don't actually have the ability to uh, have bifidobacterium, which is a, a, an important probiotic bacteria, survive in our gut microbiome. Uh, it can also place people at risk with irritable bowel syndrome and also, interestingly, uh, dental caries. So uh, probably getting more uh, dental caries and also... Um, other, other dental uh, type issues as well. So really important uh, to understand that if you are an FUT2 non-secretor, that there's a vulnerability there uh, in terms of um, our immune response. So uh, human milk oligosaccharides, definitely very important. Um, they modify the intestinal microbiome. They help with antimicrobial effects and modulation of intestinal epithelial cell response and immune development. And also that has implications for brain health. So if you know you're an FUT2 non-secretor, um, please look at human milk oligosaccharides, uh, look to your diet, and we'll talk a little bit more about that shortly. So prebiotic fibres are really important for those who are FUT2 non-secretors and also people who are APOE4 carriers. And we'll talk about this more in the cardiovascular section as well. But uh, as a little bit of background, studies on indigenous hunter-gatherers show dramatic difference in fibre intake uh, compared to Western populations. Uh, and due to the positive effect of fibre on lowering LDL cholesterol, this may be a clue that APOE4 carriers require a higher dietary intake of fibre to offset naturally elevated LDLs. Um, and these prebiotic fibres become very important uh, for those with the AA genotype and the FUT2 gene. So being an FUT2 non-secretor, it's important to have more of these prebiotic fibres. Um, and also there are higher needs for vitamins A, C and E, anthocyanins and glutathione may be required for optimal lung function and APOE4 carriers as well. So these two, two groups, if you're an FUT2 non-secretor and you have an APOE4 uh, genotype, and certainly if you have both of those, then really prebiotic fibres are going to be very important to um, immune health, but also um, helping with cardiovascular risk, reducing your cardiovascular risk. So for FUT2 non-secretor support, what can we do? So bifidobacterium species may help to modulate the immune system, but remember human milk oligosaccharides are very important because bifidobacterium require those human milk oligosaccharides in order to, to survive um, gut health. 
bifidobacterium are also uh, important to reduce the severity of upper re respiratory tract infections. And prebiotic fibres may be the best way to increase bifidobacterial populations as well. So what are prebiotics? The prebiotics are foods and that contain contain prebiotics such as bananas, garlic, leeks, barley, asparagus, pistachios, onions, polyphenol-rich foods. So they can increase uh, bifidobacterium species. And then also other nutritional supports such as black currants, cacao, um, mulberries, goji berries, black raspberries um, offer additional antiviral properties along with these polyphenols. So Prebiotics are important for everybody, but if you're an FUT2 non-secretor and we're trying to take care of our immune health, then these are another important pieces that you need to consider in terms of your nutrition. This is um, an interesting study using um, prebiotic uh, fiber support for an FUT2 non-secretor. This individual uh, prior to having to take antibiotics, had not a too bad abundance and diversity score in their gut microbiome. So abundance and diversity measures the bacterial population in the gut microbiome. And you want to have really good abundance and diversity. However, as we age, uh, that abundance tends to drop off, even though we maintain our di diversity. So if you can maintain abundance and, uh, abundance and diversity as you age in terms of your gut microbiome, that really bodes well for overall health. This individual then went on to um, antibiotic treatment for um, an infection and uh, post antibiotic treatment, you can see that uh, their abundance and diversity score dropped quite dramatically in that three week period. And then following the intake of a, a prebiotic support, these uh, fibres, plant-based fibres, after three weeks, the abundance and diversity score improved dramatically from around 4.7 back up to 5.1, which I might also add was actually better than the pre-antibiotic treatment. So these fibres, prebiotic fibres, are incredibly important for maintaining good gut health. And if you've had to take antibiotic ther therapy, then to improve your abundance and diversity, these prebiotic fibers are incredibly important. And this is some of Smart DNA's R&D project work. So probiotics and immune health. So we've talked about prebiotics. Now we're gonna be talking about probiotics, lactobacillus and bifidobacterium species. So Probiotics improve a person's health by regulating their immune system. And some trials have shown that probiotic strains can prevent respiratory infections. So this is really important that we focus on this. Remember, prebiotics feed our probiotic bacteria. They provide the metabolites that probiotic bacteria need to survive and populate our gut microbiome. And it's also been found that probiotics were better than placebo in reducing the number of participants experiencing episodes of acute urinary tract infection by about 47%, and the duration of that episode um, reducing the acute phase of that episode by nearly two days. So probiotics may slightly reduce antibiotic use or the duration for which we need to use antibiotics. And here's a number of references if you want to look at these in terms of everything I've been talking about in terms of gut health, probiotics, and our immune system. I just want to step it up a little bit and change it to talking about our glutathione enzymes, because these are an important part, but so too are other enzymes and support enzymes and other nutritional intakes that we need to to intake to improve our nutritional health and our overall immune system. So glutathione is often referred to as the body's master antioxidant. It's composed of three amino acids, cysteine, glycine, and glutamate. And glutathione is found virtually in every cell in the human body. So when I talked about everything that we eat and drink has a molecular consequence. By having improved levels of glutathione, it basically operates at a cellular level. 
And importantly here, uh, with the mitochondria in the cell, that this energy powerhouse in a cell, it's, it's glutathione, glutathione peroxidase and superoxidismutase combined uh, certainly support and protect that energy powerhouse uh, in the cell. They also protect the mitochondria from heavy metal, um, heavy metals that we may ingest or breathe in, toxins and also free radicals. So it's really very important that we understand that having adequate levels or really good levels of, of glutathione will support um, our immune health and our ability to also stave off um, the insults from heavy metals and so on. And it's really important to understand when we talk about heavy metals that we're talking about the effects on our DNA. So by having adequate levels of glutathione, it's protecting our DNA. It's protecting the proteins that are produced from our DNA because these heavy metals and toxins and pollutants basically get intercalated or attached to our DNA and they form what's called genetic lesions. So we don't want to have those genetic lesions. We want our DNA to make faithful copies of itself. And other um, glutathione enzymes are important as well, such as glutathione peroxidase. Uh, glutathione peroxidase is a selenium dependent glutathione and it's also very important in terms of its interaction with glutath glutathione and the glutathione peroxidase enzyme to protect mitochondria, as I said before. If we're looking at immune health, uh, zinc is another nutritional piece that we need to have adequate levels of zinc in our body. Zinc is known to be an antiviral agent. So having good levels of intracellular zinc is also equally important while we're speaking on this topic. Now, at Smart DNA, we look at a number of glutathione enzymes. Uh, these first two enzymes here are the rate limiting step in glutathione production. GSTP1, we look at two enzymes here. GSTP1, interestingly, is expressed in our brain, lungs, and breast tissue. It actually helps to um, remove excess estrogens, for example, from our bodies. It helps to protect our lovely delicate brain tissue from heavy metal toxicity. And then these last two enzymes here, these GST enzymes, you'll see it says null or present. So you either get a copy from your parents or you don't get a copy from your parents. Uh, and we're going to talk a little bit more about these very important GST enzymes. So they are called copy number variations. They aren't SNPs and as I said, you either have a copy of them or you don't have a copy of them. So GSTT1, uh, this enzyme uh, is absent from 38% of the world's population. Um, it's also a very potent conjugator. Um, and by that, I mean that it can help remove environmental toxins uh, and pollutants. Uh, including dichloromethane. Now, these GST enzymes can be classified into three groups, dependent upon where they're found in the cell, whether they're found in the cytoplasm, mitochondria, or their membrane associated. So they have very big roles at a cellular level. Now, interestingly, if we separate the population into the Asian population, for example, GSTT1 is deleted 80% of the time in the Asian population, whereas GSTM1 is deleted in 50% of the Caucasian population. And there are other sub enzymes of these GST enzymes. Now, we look at a map of the world and we look at GSTT1 here. And this is GSTM1 here. We can see areas where it's extremely high, high or moderate or low uh, levels of these enzymes being deleted. And just um, out of interest, if you look at the, uh, the Japanese population, they're at very high risk for both GSTT1 and GSTM1 being deleted. 
It's also very important to note that these enzymes, when they are deleted, especially both of them being deleted, so being null-null for both of them, it's associated with various chronic degenerative diseases such as hypertension, diabetes, asthma, various types of cancers, including prostate, neck, colorectal, liver, and leukemia um, across various populations. So if you don't have these enzymes present, then it's very important to start looking at how you're going to support your body via glutathione intake at a cellular level to reduce your risk of developing these diseases. I mean, we already know that glutathione levels drop as we age. So if you don't have these really important glutathione enzymes present, then extra additional support uh, is required. Now, I talked a little bit about heavy metals uh, previously in terms of these glutathione levels, and these are places where we can get exposure to uh, heavy metals. And I already talked about ethnicities uh, around the world and the likelihood that you'll have GST T1 deleted or GST M1 deleted. Other contributing factors are our sex, our age, whether we smoke or not. Um, our occupational exposure to heavy metals, our dietary habits, for example, if you're eating a lot of larger type seafood, then the biomagnification of heavy metals can occur at that point. And then there's also our DNA changes, and I, I talked a little bit about that, but importantly, just remember that exposure to heavy metals can affect our DNA. It basically becomes intercalated into our DNA. And then that can affect our proteins that we produce and um, other gene expression. And another important piece around all of this is the APOE genotypes or that genetic architecture. I'm sure you're all familiar with cysteines as being part of glutathione, very important for mopping up heavy metals. And as we go through these APOE genotypes here, APOE 2.2, all the way down to APOE44. And these are structurally quite different proteins that are produced. You'll see that we start losing cysteines and we have more arginines present. So if we can look at that as a gradient, we can see that uh, the cysteines drop off and arginines actually increase. So for individuals with an E4 allele, they are more vulnerable to uh, heavy metal uh, toxicity and also increased cellular oxidative stress. So we need to look at glutathione support for these individuals specifically. I want to talk a little bit about some of these glutathione enzymes. And I just wanted to show you that as scientists, we look at the biological processes for these enzymes, such as GCLM, this glutathione enzyme. And you can see here from research, uh, we know that they are involved in cysteine metabolic processes, glutamate metabolism, glutathione biosynthetic processes, and response to oxidative stress. So these enzymes all have a part to play in terms of helping keep our cellular levels of glutathione high. Now, we've talked about it at a cellular level, but there's also a tissue expression of these enzymes. And I just want to point out to you with this glutamate cysteine ligase, which is the first rate limit limiting step in the production of glutathione, that we find it in a number of places in, in the human body, a number of tissues in the body. And if we look at the nervous system here, it's found in brain, um, cerebral fluid, and so on, spinal cord. It's very, very important. It's also part of our immune response. So this primary glutathione enzyme here is very much involved in our immune response. So if we're looking at how to improve our immune health, then certainly having adequate levels of glutathione is important. And another really key area too is our reproductive health. If you look at the places where oxidative stress can occur, certainly with um, reproductive health, that's very important. Um, when we think about reproductive health, it's often, I find women are very concerned about 
good uh, prenatal care um, and preconception care uh, in terms of uh, having children. And males often get uh, left out of the, the equation. And it's really important that we consider uh, taking care of uh, sperm. They are incredibly sensitive to oxidative stress. So glutathione support is certainly very important uh, when it comes to making sure that sperm are of very good quality. And, and also in a nutritional sense, for example, trans fatty acids are known to induce a lot of cellular oxidative stress for sperm and they can become immotile. And uh, foods such as uh, low-fat muffins are often filled with uh, trans fats. And uh, in this study, it took three months for sperm to recover uh, when a person, when a male stopped uh, having trans fats in their diet. So it can take a considerable amount of time for sperm to recover from trans fats and the oxidative stress that ensues from that. So it's really important to consider at a cellular level what's happening with glutathione production, but then it's also equally important to understand where these enzymes are actually expressed. And so here we go, glutathione enzymes are fuel supporting the immune system. The GPX1 or glutathione peroxidase uh, enzyme, uh, equally it can be found in the cell, the cytoplasm, the mitochondria and the mitochondrial matrix. So, and specifically it's found in the cytoplasm as well. So GPX1 is a selenium dependent glutathione and it has a number of roles to play. And it's interesting that we talk about, yes, glutathione metabolism, metabolism generally, detoxification of react reactive oxygen species, but it's also important for folate metabolism. So it also connects with other pathways in the body and folate metabolism we know is extremely important in terms of B vitamin uptake and uh, protection of our DNA and so on. So really important to understand that there are other connections with other pathways in the body that glutathione peroxidase helps to support. Um, and also it's important in terms of the metabolism of lipids and lipoproteins. So that's important when we get on to talking about cardiovascular health. And here we go, GPX1, this glutathione peroxidase expression uh, in tissues. And we can see here it has a very big role to play in our blood and our immune health. And uh, likewise, we've talked about reproductive health before as well. So these glutathione enzymes are extremely important. Also very important for protecting our, our brain health, our frontal cortex, our cerebral cortex, um, even through to our eyes and are involved in, in heart health as well. So these glutathione enzymes, we say they are expressed ubiquitously throughout our bodies, but then we need to understand their expression uh, within various tissues of our body, whether it's blood and our immune health through, our, through to our reproductive health. So once again, glutathione enzymes are fuel supporting the immune system. And if you want to have some references, there's a whole pile of references here for you to look up. Okay, just moving on now to cardiovascular health and our immune function. We're going to look specifically at apolipoprotein, uh, nutrition, and our exercise. So apolipoprotein E, it's a protein involved in the metabolism of fats in the body. It's implicated in Alzheimer's disease and cardiovascular disease. And it belongs to a family of fat and metal binding proteins called apolipoproteins. So there's this intimate connection between our heart and our brain health via this ApoE genotype. It's expressed in our brain and also in our heart. And I think we know that expression, healthy heart, healthy mind. And maybe I had that in mind when we're talking about apolipoprotein E. When we look at cardiovascular health, we are able to, based on genetics and looking at apolipoprotein E, divide cardiovascular health up into six, uh, six subgroups or three main categories, okay? So apolipoprotein E, is the newest version of 
uh, apolipoprotein E. This E2 variant is not as common in the in the population. Apo E3, uh, most people fall into this group around up to 65% based on ethnicity of having an E3 allele. Apo E2, E4 is a combination of this group here and this group here. And it has a more neutral uh, effect when it comes to nutritional genomics and our nutritional intakes. And then APOE4 group, this is our most ancient form of the APOE genotype. APOE3, E4 um, is around 20 to 25% of the world's population, although based on ethnicity, it may be as much as 45% for some ethnic groups. If we start to look at energy sources of fat, proteins, and carbohydrates, we can see that there's a gradient that runs through these nutritional intakes. And if we look at the APOE4 group, I call this, this group our nutritional canaries because remember, there are problems with uh, binding of heavy metals. There's a reduced number of cysteines. But this group really is the barometer for what is wrong with our nutritional environment with um, takeaway foods, trans fats, they are so much more vulnerable. And if you think about all of this in the context of a Mediterranean style diet, then we know that one to two glasses of red wine is recommended in a Mediterranean style diet. However, if you fall into this category here and you are a male, so there are sex specific differences, then that moderate intake of alcohol can push down or suppress your HDL and push up LDL. So it's not seen to be as beneficial. However, if you fall into this APOE2 group here, HDL becomes more buoyant and LDL is suppressed with that glass of red wine. And if you look at the types of exercise that are recommended between aerobic and strength-based exercise, then we do know that uh, more aerobic-based exercise can be useful for this group because we quite literally can grow our brains, improve our memory by improving the levels of um, a protein called BDNF in our brain. And that does help to improve cognitive function because we know that this group here is associated more with a decline in cognitive function uh, as they age. So here, if we want to look at um, antioxidant capacity, this group here has the highest natural antioxidant capacity. This group down here has the lowest natural antioxidant capacity. So really important to start looking at how are we going to improve those levels of cysteine and certainly glutathione intake is one way to do that because we want to protect uh, these individuals specifically from heavy metal toxicity. And think about it another way in terms of cellular oxidative stress. Uh, this is reduced cellular oxidative stress up in this area here through to increased cellular oxidative stress for this group. So if we think back to those glutathione enzymes when they're deleted, they also push up cellular oxidative stress. So if you're already an APOE4 genotype uh, individual, and you have those glutathione deleted, then there's a combined increase in terms of cellular oxidative stress. So very important in terms of looking after our heart health and our brain health, that we keep those glutathione levels raised. Now, in keeping with our uh, immune uh, theme for this presentation, the APOE genotype, APOE4 genotype, predicts severe COVID-19 um, effects uh, in a UK biobank community uh, cohort. So they analysed data from uh, biobank in the United Kingdom to um, for this research, which endeavoured to collect genetic and health data on 500,000 volunteers aged between 48 and 86. They focused on APOE4 which is known to have an effect on cholesterol levels and also processes involved in inflammation, as well as increasing the risk of heart disease and dementia. And we've just discussed that. 
And, it, and their finding was that it is possible that the role of APOE in the immune system is important in the disease and future research, and it may be able to harness this to develop effective treatments for these individuals. So what we know right now is that individuals with an APOE4 um, genotype are at increased risk, and we need to look at how we can support the immune system specifically for these individuals. Now, the good news is that APOE4 is highly responsive to diet. So if you have an E4 allele and you change your diet, you have a very clean diet, uh, stay away from processed foods, uh, then you've got that opportunity to actually not only improve your cardiovascular health, but also start to protect your um, cognitive health as well, cognitive function. So we know that there's an increased sensitivity to excess salt and also low potassium, sugar, flour-based carbohydrates, smoking, alcohol, obesity, and a sedentary lifestyle. They all form an align, alignment and it's a, a, with this APOE4 genotype. Remember, it's our most ancient form of the APOE4 gene. It's our hunter-gatherer genotype. Now, if these individuals, these hunter-gatherer genotypes, or those with that diet, focus on protein, fat, and omega-3s, um, fiber, nuts, seeds, antioxidants, and lower carbohydrate, then uh, it appears to be the best strategy for those with an E4 allele. So basically, please think about that. If you have an E4 allele, you had a genetic test done, look at your omega-3 intake, fiber, nuts, seeds, antioxidants, and lower processed carbohydrates, um, because that is a very good strategy for managing APOE4 genotype. And also, if you have an APOE4 allele and you smoke, please know that you will fill up a cardiovascular disease ward in a hospital. You're really incredibly vulnerable to the effects of, of smoking. Um, likewise, alcohol, obesity, try not to be sedentary. And APOE4, as we talked about before, has on its own been a proven risk factor for COVID-19 severity at this time. So there's increased risks here with APOE4 uh, and, the, and then the overlay of COVID-19 uh, on those with atherosclerosis and hypertension. Um, APOE4 is found uh, predominantly in indigenous populations in Central Africa, Oceania, and also Australia. Um, however, you know, in nature, uh, it's not all bad for genotypes. If uh, a genotype was found not to be useful, then it would kind of be weeded out in a genetic sense. However, individuals with uh, E4 alleles are known to be better equipped to deal with bacterial infections. So there's a, there's a positive around that, just not viral infections, unfortunately. Um, and environments with a higher population density with viral outbreaks may be pressured uh, to a change to E3 for better protection against viruses. So it may be that there will be shifts over time in the world's population more towards the E3 genotype. Now, APOE4 carriers immunity and nutrition. Um, I really want to focus on this because this is an area where we can truly make some differences for those with an E4 allele. We know that E4 allele carriers generally have higher vitamin D and calcium levels than E3 carriers. And this may be an advantage uh, in the northern latitudes where there is less sun exposure. However, uh, as I said before, and just to reinforce this, E4 carriers have increased sensitivity to excess salt, low potassium. So what we need to do here is look at a more natural salt a salt that is higher in potassium and lower in sodium. Try and cut back on sugar, flour-based carbohydrates, that means processed carbohydrates, smoking, alcohol, and so on. Uh, in terms of diet-induced dyslipidemia or abnormalities uh, in the cholesterol profiles, um, we know that um, can be altered uh, in terms of trafficking of immune cells to the lung and um, increase the risk of respiratory tract infections for those with an E4 allele. So as I said before, and I can't reinforce this enough, there's a higher need for vitamins A, C, E, anthocyanins, so things like blueberries, blackberries, um, 
Glutathione may be required for optimal lung function in these E4 carriers as well. Just a little summary and some extra information here for you to go back and, and look at. Um, and another important piece here, it was a small study that was done, but if you're uh, having your cholesterol monitored or you're having a pulse test done um, and an extended lipid profile, and you're following all the nutritional advice, yet you're forming these small, dense LDLs, have a look at how much olive oil intake you're using because in a small study they found that individuals with an E4 allele formed more small dense LDLs which are more arthrogenic when olive oil was used. Um, as I said before just to reinforce this APOE4 carriers have the lowest natural antioxidant status so look at uh, antioxidant intake uh, E4 carriers have the highest level of cellular oxidative stress. So once again, focus on antioxidant intake. If you know your genetics, then you have more of an idea of what your risk is. Um, plant-based protein is recommended. And remember, with plant-based protein, we've got uh, more of an anti-inflammatory style diet. And that's going to be useful too for APOE4 carriers. Um, E4s are more vulnerable to stress, so try and reduce stress if you can. And just remember that binding of heavy metals. And then also think about those glutathione enzymes, GSTT1, GSTM1, in association with being an APOE4 carrier. And I just want to come back and uh, reinforce here around cardiovascular health and bring a, close that loop on gut health again and just remind you all that with animal protein, eating a lot of animal protein, it can push up levels of TMAO, this trimethylamine N oxide. Okay, it's generated from choline, betaine and carnitine, okay, via gut microbiome. Remember, 50% is determined by diet. And then we've got drug administration, okay? It can also affect um, mayo, and that can have an effect on cardiovascular health. Okay, and then finally looking at exercise and APOE genotype. So if you have a poor cholesterol profile, look at um, strength training, um, high inter interval training uh, recommended for E4 carriers to improve cardiovascular markers. Um, conversely, those with an E2 allele have the most substantial increase in plasma HDL with endurance exercise training compared to the E3 and E4 genotypes. So we know that fibre is very important. If we're looking at an E4 allele person, uh, we know that they have an increased need for fibre intake, uh, and this may have a positive benefit in lowering LDL cholesterol. So it can help to offset naturally occurring elevated LDL. Remember, the shape, the conformational shape of the APOE genotype determines how it responds to our nutritional intakes as well. And it also uh, dictates largely what cholesterol profiles can look like. So individuals with an E4 allele typically have elevated or slightly higher levels of total cholesterol, for example. And then closing that loop again um, on our gut health too, Remember, if you are the AA genotype, if you're an FUT2 gene non-secretor, please look at prebiotic fibre. Uh, we need it more for those individuals, and that will certainly help with immune health as well. Welcome, everybody. And this presentation is entitled Risk Factors Contributing to Endothelial Injury and Cardiovascular Disease. 
the role of glutathione, zinc, inflammation, and reactive oxygen species in tissue recovery. I'm Dr. Margie Smith. I'm co-founder of Smart DNA, and I look forward to sharing this information with you today. So first of all, what is, the, what is the endothelium and what does it do? So the endothelium is a tissue which forms a single layer of cells lining various organs and cavities of the body, especially the blood vessels, heart, and lymphatic vessels. Now, endothelial cells release substances that control vascular relaxation and contraction, as well as enzymes that control blood clotting, immune function, and platelet adhesion. So it plays a very important role in the human body, and we definitely need to know how to protect our endothelium. Now, risk factors that can induce inflammation and endothelial injury. Now, the list is long under various categories, and I want to go through some of these examples of contributing risk factors. And I put some little images up here as well, uh, just as kind of a shortcut, for example, if we're looking at metabolic syndrome, contributing pieces to metabolic syndrome. But certainly uh, with metabolic syndrome, it's a combination of uh, disease states in the body. Uh, first of all, cholesterol, so altered cholesterol profiles um, and specifically elevated triglycerides and low HDL or protective um, HDL cholesterol. Now, uh, from a genetics perspective, if we see that a person is predisposed to um, low HDL and then uh, we find that they indeed do have from their blood results low HDL. Some of the uh, recommendations based on genetics is that first of all, you should try and go and exercise because uh, certainly as we age, lower HDL can be uh, contributed to by just general lack of, of exercise. So that will be one important piece. And then a component of HDL called APOA1 uh, is also um, associated with uh, a nutrigenomic response whereby based on genetics, either lowering polyunsaturated fats or increasing polyunsaturated fats can help to push up or make more buoyant that HDL. Um, insulin resistance, uh, yes, so this can lead to uh, the development of uh, type 2 diabetes. Uh, so this is another area where uh, it's a risk factor uh, contained within this metabolic syndrome area and also um, elevated blood pressure. So these are a multiplicity of um, disease states that when they combine uh, lead to a um, lead to metabolic syndrome as it's described. Now other areas are oxidative stress, uh, and systemic inflammation and the formation of free radicals uh, via antioxidant imbalances. So some of the pieces that I have in here are dietary malnutrition. Now you might think I'd put dietary nutrition, but really I'm talking about people eating processed foods, sugars, trans fats, refined carbohydrates, um, and deep fried foods. So this really is malnutrition. This is not uh, good nutrition. So these foods, uh, as well as having an impact on cholesterol, also uh, have a, a knock-on effect with our gut microbiome. Our gut microbiome is our largest immune um, organ in our body, and basically diet contributes to 50% of what our microbiome looks like. So if we want to take care of our immune health, we want to down-regulate inflammation, we want to um, improve that antioxidant uh, imbalance, then certainly the foods we eat uh, affect not only, for example, our cholesterol profiles, but also our gut microbiome. And then we lead into vitamin deficiencies and certainly nutrigenomic interactions. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that later on. So the playing field is not an even playing field when it comes to looking at um, our genetics and our nutritional responses. And then we also have antioxidant depletion due to um, other things like uh, pollution ex and uh, exposure to UV rays, um, bacterial infections, viral infections, and certainly periodontal disease as another um, risk factor. 
uh, which can result in um, endothelial injury. So our oral uh, microbiome or the bacteria in our mouths, uh, we need to make sure that we do not have infections because um, that can lead to damage of um, endothelial tissue in our heart. So it's a, it's a very important piece. Um, other areas to, to look at too in terms of oxidative stress, physical stress, um, sleep hygiene, are you getting enough uh, sleep, good quality sleep, and certainly sleep apnea is a contributing factor to endothelial damage. Now, it's interesting, we, we know that smoking is certainly a contributing factor to um, heart disease. Um, and then when we look at exercise, I've got lack of exercise and too much exercise. So you might think, well, you can't win. I mean, what should I do? And it's, it's everything in moderation. And we must also consider how much um, aerobic exercise we're doing versus um, lifting weights, for example. So running versus um, lifting weights to keep our muscle mass um, intact. We also need to think about age and stage of life. So recommendations for a 25-year-old person um, and with respect to exercise is going to be very different um, to a 60-year-old female, for example. So we really need to ensure that the, the exercise is fitting our age and stage of life. And remember, with over-exercise, we're inducing more um, production of free radicals and oxidative stress. So that can lead to an antioxidant imbalance. So we may be looking great on the outside, but the cellular damage can be uh, quite marked um, due to, to over-exercise. Uh, also, um, mental stress, depression, anxiety are, are contributing factors as well. And uh, as I mentioned before, uh, sleep hygiene, making sure you get that eight hours sleep. Now, medications can also contribute to um, endothelial injury as well. So uh, it's important that you review your uh, medication intake um, and, and make sure that, that they're up to date and you've had reviews uh, because we don't want to be inducing endothelial injury. And also we want to make sure that the, um, the drugs that we are taking are, are helpful to uh, reducing endothelial injury. Um, autoimmune diseases certainly um, can contribute more to endothelial damage. So psoriasis, those with lupus, uh, multiple sclerosis, inflammatory bowel disease and rheumatoid arthritis. And it's interesting in these individuals, we also see alterations in the gut microbiome. So we're trying to make that um, delicate and intimate connection between all parts of our body here when it comes to overall health. Um, hormones can also um, affect uh, endothelial damage, thyroid hormones, hormone, hormonal imbalances and menopause. And it's interesting too with the gut microbiome that we can actually recycle um, hormones in a deleterious way due, due to um, certain species of bacteria and the genes that they contain. So we don't want to be recycling these hormones either. And then also other risk factors, uh, for example, are cancer. So uh, whether you have a cancer diagnosis, cancer drugs and chemotherapy can also uh, cause inflammation and endothelial injury. So these are some, some risk factors that we need to consider when, we, when we're looking at endothelial damage and overall health. This is another way of looking um, at the information I've just given you. It's, it's a summary of those areas. Uh, I think some important points to make are um, age of an individual, comorbidities uh, with COVID-19, um, because this is a, a health crisis that the world is seeing right now, this global pandemic. So um, if we're looking at overlaying COVID-19 um, on those comorbidities and endothelial injury, we can see that there are definitely the same list of um, events here uh, from immune suppression, liver diseases, cancer, um, obesity, diabetes, metabolic syndrome. So these are areas of concern. And then we also um, have um, ethnicity with um, African Americans being more susceptible to COVID-19. Uh, and that, that's really come out through the literature in relation to um, genetics and um, areas such as zinc deficiency um, in these populations. 
Now, COVID-19 um, receptors and why the lining of your arteries is damaged, so this endothelial lining has become damaged. So COVID-19 or SARS-CoV-2, it binds to the human ACE2 receptor. So if we look at uh, the SARS-CoV-2, we can see that it has this S protein or spike. Now, what happens is it goes through the cell membrane and it docks with ACE2. So they basically become connected um, through this S spike, through the cell membrane and into ACE2. So it's a host cell receptor. And um, it's been shown that treatment with anti-ACE2 antibodies disrupts this interaction between the virus and this ACE2 receptor. Now, the important thing with ACE2 is that it has a role in the renin-angiotensinogen system, or RAS, and it's a target for the treatment of hypertension. Now, ACE2 is mainly expressed in vascular endothelial cells and arterial smooth muscle cells and organs. And um, I've highlighted here that it's also found in the oral and nasal mucosa, and nasopharynx and lung. So if we look at the oral and nasal mucosa and nasopharynx, then we can see that this is an entry point for um, COVID-19 uh, in the human body. So basically we can inhale the SARS-CoV-2 through up our nose and our mouth, and our eyes, and basically it will dock via ACE2 and gain an entry point into our bodies. Now, just to show you um, why ACE2 uh, became was on our radar in terms of its role uh, with COVID-19, we can see here for ACE2, if we go across, uh, it actually has a role as a virus receptor. So virus receptor activity, it's regular regulation of um, cytokines or inflammatory agents as well. So this is a pretty big clue that it could have a role uh, with COVID-19. These are some other details from the Human Protein Atlas Summary of ACE2. Uh, and I think it's important just to, to note down here that biological process that has been highlighted as host virus interaction and then we look here, in addition, the encoded protein is a functional receptor for the spike glycoprotein of the human coronavirus, SARS. So there's some really good detailed information if anyone's interested in looking more um, at ACE2 from a human protein perspective. Now, just changing things up a little bit here, this is some really exciting work that's come out of um, Oak Ridge National Lab in Tennessee just recently. And what they did was they looked at 40,000 genes from 17,000 genetic samples in an effort to better understand COVID-19. Now, this supercomputer took one week to analyze all that data. It's a, it's a massive uh, effort, and it revealed some really interesting new information. And the theory that came out was that COVID-19 impacts the body by the um, by the bradykinin system, or it was called the bradykinin hypothesis. And COVID-19 infection begins when the virus enters the body through ACE2 receptors in the nose, and we talked about that just in the previous slide. Um, and it's because these targets are abundant uh, in our nasal cavity. Um, the virus then proceeds through the body, entering the cells and other places where ACE2 is also present, the intestines, kidneys, and heart. Um, and it also accounts for at least some of the diseases, cardiac and um, gastrointestinal symptoms. So we've got this new hypothesis now, the bradykinin hypothesis. So where does ACE fit with this? So ACE normally degrades bradykinin, but when the virus connects with it, it down-regulates or shuts it down. So it can't do this effectively. And now we think this may be the result of two storms occurring. There's the bradykinin storm and a cytokine or inflammatory storm. So this renin-angiotensinogen system controls many aspects of the circulatory system, including the body's levels of a chemical called bradykinin, which normally helps to regulate blood pressure. Now, the important thing here is that as bradykinin builds up in the body, it dramatically increases vascular permeability. 
So it makes our blood vessels leaky. So that, that can't be good. So if we look at this a little more, we've now got leaky blood vessels. This is, um, this is a lung. This is going down into the alveoli here. And if we look, the alveolus, one of these basically is involved in oxygen exchange and it has it's a thin gas permeable membrane. But if we've got COVID-19 infection going on, what happens is due to the down regulation of ACE2, we get this production of hyaluronic acid occurring. And remember now, we've also got these leaky vessels. And what hyaluronic acid can do is basically soak up um, all that excess liquid, the, the leaking blood vessel material, and it makes a gel, this hydrogel, and it prevents, uh, it makes it very difficult for us to breathe. So it's a little bit like breathing through jello. And it also re results in this inflamed and thickened membrane. So the, this is the reason why through this bradykinin hypothesis, this theory that it makes it very hard for people with COVID-19 infection to actually breathe. So what we know from ACE2 receptors and heart health is about one in five hospitalized COVID-19 patients have damage to their hearts, even if they never had a cardiac issue before. And some of this is likely due to the virus infecting the heart directly through its ACE2 receptors. Remember, ACE2 is also expressed in the heart and in specifically in endothelial tissues. But the, but the um, receptors also control aspects of cardiac contraction and blood pressure. And according to the researchers, bradykinin storms could create arrhythmias and low blood pressure which is often seen in COVID-19 patients. So moving on now, looking at risk groups and symptoms of COVID-19 and zinc deficiency. And I want to um, look at, at this area because it also highlights the, the other areas of deficiency uh, in human beings, not just zinc. So if we look at uh, COVID-19 and zinc deficiency, um, it's actually a very impressive list of people that are vulnerable via zinc deficiency uh, when they're exposed to COVID-19. And it's almost the same kind of list that I presented very early on in this presentation. So cardiovascular diseases, autoimmune diseases, remember I mentioned rheumatoid arthritis, multiple sclerosis, for example, kidney diseases, those on dialysis, um, those with obesity, diabetes, cancer, atherosclerosis, so existing heart conditions, liver, liver cirrhosis, immune, immunosuppression. Um, and so they, they're all associated with these low zinc levels. Okay, so this impressive looking figure here is looking at the viral mechanism of COVID-19 and how uh, it might be opposed by zinc. And it's looking at a combination of data so if we look at the risk groups again, just to summarize that. So there's an impressive intersection of known risk factors for zinc deficiency in this blue circle here, and the predisposition for severe COVID-19 infection in the red circle. So it's this intersection piece that really shows um, the risk factors for zinc deficiency and also COVID-19 infection. And if we move our way through the next two images here, two and three, this is looking at zinc supplementation um, and it might already prevent the viral entry and also suppression and replication um, of the virus. Um, so it also supports at the same time antiviral responses in host cells. So that's a very important piece that zinc uh, supplementation may decrease viral replication and also stop the binding of the virus to the ACE2 receptor that we discussed previously. Now, when it comes to the lung barrier and lung function, there's another important piece here in relation to zinc, and that it increases the ciliary length, so these ciliary fibers here, that help us to clear our lungs. Um, and also it sustains, uh, stops the, um, the tissue injury 
um, and also the entrance of the virus uh, can be impeded at this point uh, with um, appropriate zinc uh, levels in the body. Now, from five through to 10, if, if we summarize this information, um, we're looking here at the importance of zinc on the development and function of the immune cells. And that's, that's manifold throughout this section. Um, it should be underlined that zinc's effects should not generally be described as activating or inhibiting, um, as zinc in various cases normalizes overshooting of immune reactions and balances the ratios of various immune cell types. So zinc can prevent, for example, the high levels of inflammatory mediators, including reactive oxygen species and nitrogen species that destroy host tissue. So that's a really important piece when we're looking at reactive oxygen species pr production. And we talked about glutathione as the master antioxidant in this role. And also controlling and regulating the immune response between anti-inflammatory cytokines and pro-inflammatory cytokines. Now, if we look at point 11 here, um, on first view, it appears sort of contradictory in a way that the zinc increases the act activation um, and induced production of reactive oxygen species in platelets, um, while it's generally considered to be antioxidative. However, and this is interesting, that in the case of platelets, up to a certain threshold, reactive oxygen species production is essential as it can prevent the formation of platelet aggregates. So if we look at this diagram in summary, um, what we can say is that zinc might be able to prevent vascular complications observed in COVID-19 patients. So um, one other way to look at this data is to go to this publication. Um, and each of these sections here are discussed um, more fully than what I have done in this presentation. And in summary, what we can say is that Zinc and glutathione are important allies in the fight against viral replication, reactive oxygen species, inflammation, bradykinin and cytokine storms and tissue recovery. So, you know, as a combined effect, the synergy between these two, zinc and glutathione, um, is really very impressive when it comes to looking at lung barrier function um, and immune support in relation to COVID-19. Um, so there's a nice summary. Please go and review this publication for further details. Antioxidants, so what are they? Well, antioxidants are amazing because what they manage to do is donate electrons to what has become a free radical because it's actually unstable. And this free radical basically needs another electron for it to be paired. Now, typically, it will try and grab that from a healthy atom. But the problem with that is it leads to ageing and ageing-related diseases. So how do we get on top of all of this? How do we have healthy ageing? I mentioned uh, in the uh, slide, two slides back, glutathione, it's a central role um, in electron donation. It's a master antioxidant, um, and it, it helps to stop oxidizing. These antioxidants, they all work together, giving and receiving electrons, but glutathione sits as central um, antioxidant because it's able to continuously donate these electrons. Now, when we look at where we're donating enzymes, this is, if we think about this as coming from the mitochondria, this is our powerhouse of our cell. We produce energy via ATP. So it's very important that we protect our mitochondria, that we continue to produce energy. And when I look at these lists um, of other um, enzymes here, CoQ10, for example, we know from uh, genetics that once again there's not an even playing field in this area either there's a uh, polymorphism or a DNA change that basically if you have that makes this CoQ10 enzyme very unstable and it basically ceases to function and it's part of our mitochondrial transport chain so if you have 
this reduced enzyme efficiency in CoQ10, for example, the need for glutathione is going to be markedly increased. Uh, for example, in human beings, vitamin E, um, majority of the population or well, population carries a uh, genetic variant, which means that we really need to ensure that our vitamin E levels are, are adequate. And we can do that via eggs, nuts, leafy vegetables, for example. Vitamin C, uh, once again, this is not an even playing field either. There's a uh, transporter of uh, vitamin C from our gut through to the rest of our body. If we have a uh, genetic variant in that vitamin C uh, gene or enzyme that's produced, then we are vulnerable to lower levels of vitamin C. And we know that vitamin C is an anti-cancer um, nutrient. So basically, we can look at these diagrams, but if we look at people um, individually, we can see that to greater and lesser extents, their demands for um, this centralized piece of glutathione can become really very important as um, an anti-aging part of our anti-aging process. So if we look at glutathione as this master antioxidant, it's able to neutralize a variety of free radicals, and there are a whole plethora of these different sorts of free radicals. Um, it's highly concentrated in the cell, and as I mentioned, it protects our mitochondrial DNA. It, it helps with a phase two detoxification of environmental chemicals via a glutathione detoxification pathway, and there are a number of glutathione-related enzymes, and I'll talk about them in the, in the next slide. Uh, and also as an immune enhancer, it protects and regulates immune cells and the, the maintenance of a healthy immune system. So if we're looking at our current pandemic environment, anything that will help to um, support our immune system is really important because we don't have an answer to uh, COVID-19 at the moment. So we need to invest in our immune health. Um, and here we can see from this work by Dr. Alexei Polnikov that oxidative stress contributes to hyperinflammation of lung, leading to adverse disease outcomes such as acute respiratory distress syndrome, multi organ failure, and death. And poor antioxidant defense due to endogenous glutathione deficiency is the most probable cause of increased oxidative damage in the lung. And we've talked about the bradykinin hypothesis and the cytokine storm um, hypothesis with COVID-19. So really important to invest in antioxidant support. You know, what are the sources of glutathione precursors to boost cellular glutathione? So there's oral uh, glutathione in the form of dietary um, protein or whey protein, um, but they're ineffective and inexpensive and can add up to 2,000 calories to achieve the equivalent of target precursors. So probably not the best approach to be taking. And N-acetylcysteine or NAC is more efficient. That's more affordable than oral glutathione. Um, however, it's much more difficult to raise um, concentrations of N-acetylcysteine. Um, and so it may not be therapeutically um, as useful as ribosine. So it's a D-ribose uh, conjugated to a cysteine, um, and it's the most effective oral precursor since it doesn't require an enzyme to be active, uh, and it splits to its components and it upregulates glutathione synthesis. So there's a really useful way to actually improve our cellular glutathione levels. Now, this diagram is going to show us reactive oxygen species and how we can actually balance out those reactive oxygen species that are so deleterious um, to our mitochondria. Um, there are other sources of um, these reactive oxygen species. Um, and there's also a sophisticated enzyme and non-enzymatic antioxidant defense system, catalase, superoxide dismutase, glutathione peroxidase, to help us counteract um, reactive oxygen species uh, levels in the body. The problem is that um, if we are producing uh, reactive oxygen species um, and our glutathione levels are low 
and then we expect our antioxidant defences to kick in and help us, that may not be the case. And we have to think about this as a whole anti-ageing approach, as well as how to protect our endothelial lining and our heart, lungs and so on, our, and support our immune system. So let's presuppose that we're actually producing uh, these reactive oxygen species via our mitochondria, we have a depletion of glutathione levels, then these other enzymatic systems are not going to function particularly well. Now, the other aspect to all of this is that catalase, superoxidismutase, glutathione peroxidase, um, vitamins A, C and E, these are all uh, enzymes that are prone to having greater or lesser abilities within um, our cells as antioxidant defense systems. So, for example, we can have polymorphisms in any of these enzymes here, and it means that our antioxidant uh, defenses are not going to be um, as useful. And this is where glutathione, as that master antioxidant, comes to, into play to basically help support the, the antioxidant defences in our body. For example, uh, GPX glutathione peroxidase here, um, this glutathione peroxidase is found in our brain, lungs and breast tissue, and it's a selenium-dependent glutathione, but nonetheless it is still part of our glutathione defence system. Um, I talked about vitamins um, vitamin C previously, um, that if you have a polymorphism there, you are more vulnerable to lower levels of vitamin C. There are also the um, glutathione enzymes, GSTT1, GSTM1. If they are deleted, then that severely impacts phase two detox. So once again, the intake of um, Glutathione precursors are extremely important to, to support the system. Other places where we can be exposed, exogenous forms are through UV light, radiation, chemotherapeutic drugs, um, environmental toxins. So it leads to the production of all these reactive oxygen species. The best outcome that we can hope for is to have this homeostasis whereby um, our exposure to these um, exogenous forms um, of DNA damaging um, components and then through the endogenous sources, for example, mitochondria, um, that basically our antioxidant defence systems keeps it all in balance. We have normal growth and normal metabolism in our bodies. However, um, if we have less ability to uh, control these reactive oxygen species, then we can have uh, decreased proliferative responses and defective host defences. And then over here, if we have impaired physiological function in our bodies, we can incur random cellular damage to our DNA. This can affect specific pathways, and this can lead to premature ageing, disease, and cell death. So it's a really critical piece how, how our body at a cellular level can manage these reactive oxygen species. So just to recap, glutathione is a master antioxidant, which is supportive of all the other enzymatic systems in our bodies. So reactive oxygen species and endothelial dysfunction now, so targeting that endothelial dysfunction. So we've looked at that that really lovely diagram on the previous slide. Now, if we summarise this in terms of endothelial dysfunction, if this is an endothelial cell, we don't want the balance be, to be out on our antioxidant defence system and our reactive oxygen species to really be taking charge because this can lead to endothelial activation and then dysfunction. Okay, so we want this to be in balance. Um, and this, this imbalance represents the primary cause of endothelial dys dysfunction, leading to vascular damage in both metabolic and atherosclerotic diseases. So self-care, how do we take care of our endothelium? How do we take care of our immune system? 
and our, and our health. So it comes back down to self-care around our diet, our exercise, so for age and stage of life, uh, supplementation and prescribed medications, ensuring that they are updated regularly and understood why we're taking them and what are the benefits to taking them, and also sleep. So 80% of heart disease is preventable with these healthy lifestyle modifications. And of course, no smoking. So what does a healthy eating plate look like? It looks a heck of a lot different to the, the pyramid that some of us have been used to seeing. If we can visualize this plate and represent this plate when we eat every day to make sure that half of the plate is made up of plant-based eating, uh, a quarter is protein, and then this third is carbohydrates. And um, I think that this is the, the key to eating well. So if we look at diet specifically, we know a Mediterranean-style diet is great for heart health. Now, based on genetics, uh, that may be, need to be tweaked. But in general terms, a Mediterranean-style diet is useful. Olive oil, avocado oil is another really healthful oil. We need that balance with exercise between resistance and cardio training and remember age and stage of life. And then other supplements that are useful are aged garlic extract, berberine, niacin, omega-3 fish oil, vitamin D3 for so many reasons. It's so important for immune health. Um, and the glutathione precursor D-ribosine and L-cysteine. So thank you all for listening. Um, I'd like to thank Simone Walsh, who's the co-founder of Smart DNA in the small group that does uh, nutritional research and gut microbiome research. I um, would like to thank Sue Barron and the Australian team who we've been working with uh, since 2009 in this space. And Sue certainly recognised the intersection between nutritional genomics uh, and nutritional support. Um, we'd like to thank our great friend Bobby Horn uh, in the United States for her continued support and also Joe Voyer Tiki from Max International. Thank you very much. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Margie. As always, I have taken copious notes uh, for the benefit of our attendees today. I will be emailing you a list of the studies cited by Dr. Smith in her presentation. So please check your email on the last day of the symposium. Um, if you have questions for Dr. Smith, please jot them down, and I will give you an email address at the end of the symposium so we can get your questions answered. Our next presenter is Dr. Scott Nagasawa, someone whose medical presentations I've had the pleasure of enjoying for over 10 years. Scott received his Doctor of Pharmacy degree from the University of Southern California and is a registered pharmacist. He spent over 12 years at a large teaching hospital in Los Angeles, California, affiliated with the University of Southern California, where he served as the Director of Pharmaceutical Services. During this period, Scott also held the position of Clinical Instructor of Pharmacy Practice at USC and later as Adjunct Assistant Professor of Pharmacy Practice. Scott transitioned into the private sector with a regional pharmacy, serving as a Vice President of Pharmacy Services. He was instrumental in the planning and implementation of a strategic business plan that transformed the company from a regional to a nationwide pharmacy service. As Senior Vice President of Professional Services, Scott was responsible for nursing and pharmacy operations. Scott became a partner with a small home infusion service provider where he developed and implemented a business plan that resulted in rapid growth. The company was sold to a large pharmacy provider in California where he also served as Vice President of Operations. Dr. Nagasawa joined the company Celgevity, founded by himself, his father, Dr. Herbert T. Nagasawa, his brother, Dr. Stuart Nagasawa, and Scott Nomi. Scott Nagasawa served as Chief Technical Officer for the startup company responsible for product registration, company certifications, regulatory practices, safety studies, technical sales support, and the development and reviewing of product documentation. Scott currently serves on the MAX International Science Research Team as Executive Director of Product Research. 
It is great pleasure that I introduce you to Dr. Scott Nagasawa. Thank you, Scott. I hope everybody is well and we're all staying healthy by practicing safe distancing. I would like to acknowledge Bobby Horn for all of our hard work behind the scenes in organizing this event. My presentation will be about 45 minutes in length and will primarily focus on the research and development arrival scene since Dr. Smith spoke about the different types of free radicals and the interplay with the antioxidants, this will not be included in my presentation. As she pointed out, the scientific community regard glutathione as a master antioxidant because glutathione plays a significant role in maintaining cellular homeostasis. There have been many advances in cellular biochemistry in the last three decades, which has provided us with a better understanding of cellular oxidative stress and its relationship to inflammation and disease development. Glutathione and the glutathione enzymes are crucial in the cell's defense against oxidative stress. As a result, glutathione has gained the attention from researchers all over the world, surpassing the research of other antioxidants with over 150,000 published studies. This is the outline I plan to follow. Today, I will review the different types of antioxidants that make up our antioxidant defense system that protect our cells against free radical damage. I'll give a brief introduction to glutathione's biochemistry. We'll discuss how glutathione functions as an antioxidant, a detoxifier, an immune system enhancer. What are the many causes of glutathione depletion? The research and development of ribosine by Dr. Herbert Nagasawa, which was specifically designed to support the natural production of glutathione. And this will include reviewing the early proof of concept studies. Uh, so with that, we'll go ahead and get started. Our natural antioxidant defense system that protects our cells against free radical damage is made up of three distinct groups of antioxidants. And these three groups of antioxidants all work together to neutralize the different types of free radicals that we are exposed to. The first group of antioxidants that make up this defense system are the exogenous antioxidants, or simply those antioxidants that we get through the foods that we eat. This includes vitamin C, vitamin E, your flavonoids, your polyphenols, as well as all the other antioxidants we receive in our diets. Therefore, it's important we consume these antioxidants with a diet rich in fruits and vegetables. The second group of antioxidants that are part of this defense system are the endogenous antioxidants. And these antioxidants are naturally produced by the body for the purpose of protecting our cells against free radical damage. And this group includes glutathione, alpha lipoic acid, and coenzyme Q10 or CoQ10. Glutathione, as you may suspect, plays a key role as part of this defense system. And I'll talk more about this in detail a bit later. The third and final group are the endogenous antioxidant enzymes. These include the superoxide dismutase enzyme, catalase, glutathione peroxidase, and there are other glutathione enzymes as well. Both glutathione and superoxide dismutase are found in the mitochondria of our cells to neutralize a superoxide free radical, which is the most common free radical that we're exposed to. The superoxide dismutase enzyme will convert the superoxide free radical to hydrogen peroxide and oxygen. The enzyme catalase further reduces the hydrogen peroxide to harmless water and oxygen. The glutathione peroxidase enzyme also detoxifies the peroxides and its activity has been associated with cardiovascular disease. Therefore, the activity of this enzyme was measured and evaluated as part of the cardiovascular studies that were conducted on ribosine. Collectively, these are the antioxidants that make up our antioxidant defense system that protects our cells against free radical damage by supporting the different groups or components of the antioxidant defense system becomes a strategy to promote healthy aging and incorporated as part of our product formulation rationale. The combination of antioxidants from food, the naturally produced antioxidants, and nutrients supporting the antioxidant enzymes provided in the MAX products will give us the best defense against oxidative stress. Oxidative stress was first defined in the 1980s by Professor Helmut Size, and if you think about it, really not too long ago. But now, oxidative stress is a ubiquitous term 
used to describe the situation when there are more free radicals being produced from metabolic and environmental sources, but not enough antioxidants within our system to neutralize all these free radicals. This imbalance is damaging to our cells. Oxidative stress with low glutathione levels has been associated with over 75 diseases and disorders, which includes certain cardiovascular disorders like atherosclerosis and endothelial dysfunction, neurodegenerative diseases, which include Parkinson's and Alzheimer's, diabetes as a form of oxidative stress, macular degeneration and cataract formation has also been linked to this imbalance, many inflammatory diseases and disorders, male fertility, and the list just goes on and on. Well, now's a good time to transition and talk about glutathione and why it is considered the master antioxidant. Let me just say that glutathione is essential for our health. It happens to be the most abundant antioxidant in our tissues, naturally produced by the body for the purpose of being our natural cell protector. And therefore, it's no surprise that it's found in virtually all of our cells. Glutathione is considered the master antioxidant because it performs many cellular functions in the body, including supporting amino acid transport, DNA repair and synthesis, but it is best known for its three primary roles. As an antioxidant, it is capable of neutralizing many different types of free radicals. It is highly concentrated in our cells, and this is where antioxidants are most needed. Glutathione is one of the few antioxidants found in the mitochondria of our cells to protect mitochondria DNA. And this is an extremely important function as mitochondria dysfunction has been linked to the development of many chronic diseases. Glutathione eliminates toxic environmental chemicals that we inhale and ingest through a process known as a glutathione detoxification pathway, which I plan to talk about here shortly. And as an immune system enhancer, glutathione helps regulate and protect our immune cells, and therefore is critical in maintaining a healthy immune system. Here is a chemical structure of, glutath of the glutathione molecule. It is a tripeptide and contains three amino acids, glutamic acid, cysteine, and glycine. And it's a cysteine amino acid, as you can see, that has this SH group on it. And this SH group has a very important function. It is also known as a thiol or the sulfhydro group. And it's a sulfhydro group that is the electron donor that gives glutathione its antioxidant activity and its ability to detoxify many environmental toxins. And it's key to glutathione's function. But because the sulfhydro group gets oxidized very easily, losing its electron, its bioavailability is affected making it difficult to get through the gastrointestinal system. Glutathione is available as a dietary supplement in the U.S., but really has limited value when taken orally. This free sulfhydro group that makes glutathione a powerful antioxidant and detoxifier, inherent to this property, though, the glutathione molecule can be easily oxidized and also degraded by stomach and intestinal enzymes. Therefore, the majority of the scientific and medical community regard oral glutathione as an ineffective method to increase intercellular glutathione levels. Here is a biochemical pathway for the production of glutathione. We manufacture glutathione in our cells in two simple steps. Both steps require a specific enzyme and ATP as the energy source. The first step is the combining of the two amino acids, glutamic acid and cysteine, to form the intermediate gamma glutamyl cysteine. And the second and final step is the addition, addition of glycine to form glutathione. This glutathione production pathway happens to be homeostatically regulated. And our cells have the ability to increase or decrease glutathione production based upon the glutathione level within the cell. This ability to improve cellular glutathione is extremely important to the health of the cell. In oxidative stress, when the cell does not have enough antioxidants to neutralize all the free radicals that are being produced, resulting in lower glutathione levels, our cells will respond 
by activating this first enzyme, glutamate cysteine ligase, so our cells can produce more glutathione. And this is a defense mechanism our cells have to try to avoid oxidative stress by manufacturing additional glutathione. But glutathione's ability to rally in oxidative stress will depend on the amount of the cysteine amino acid, as it is a rate-limiting amino acid for the production of glutathione. And this is a key concept. If the cysteine is in short supply, this will slow glutathione production, preventing glutathione's ability to rally in oxidative stress. Glutathione's response to oxidative stress is an example of how important glutathione is to the health of our cells, because it's glutathione that our cells will depend on to protect it from oxidative stress or cellular damage by manufacturing additional glutathione. So the cell can reestablish this critical balance between the free radicals and its antioxidant defense system, making glutathione a key component of this defense system that protects our cells against oxidative stress, which is further evidence why glutathione is considered the master antioxidant. Here is an illustration of glutathione functioning as an antioxidant. When we refer to glutathione, we are generally referring to glutathione in its reduced form or when it's capable of being an antioxidant. And it's designated as GSH, G standing for glutathione, and SH for that very important sulfhydro group. In the presence of a hydroxyl free radical, glutathione will give up its hydrogen and electron to this hydroxyl free radical, which will then be detoxified to water. After glutathione donates its electron, it will combine with another glutathione molecule that has also lost its electron to form the oxidized form of glutathione, or GSSG. In the medical literature, it's often referred to as glutathione disulfide. It is important to note that glutathione itself never becomes a free radical after donating its electron, but rather forms this oxidized form of glutathione, or GSSG. And this is not true for the majority of antioxidants, which become weak free radicals after donating their electron. I think one of the most unique features of glutathione, and certainly a point of distinction, is it's able to recycle itself unlike other antioxidants. So after glutathione donates its electron to neutralize a free radical, forming the oxidized form of glutathione, or GSSG, it can regenerate or recycle itself with the help of a glutathione enzyme known as glutathione reductase. In other words, it can get from its oxidized form back into its reduced form so it can function as an antioxidant again and can continue to neutralize free radicals over and over again through this process. It's also responsible for recycling other key antioxidants like vitamin C and vitamin E back to their active states. The ratio of the reduced form of glutathione and the oxidized form of glutathione or GSSG defines the redox balance of the cell or the reduction oxidation balance of the cell, which indicates the health of the cell and its ability to resist toxic challenge. In oxidative stress, this ratio becomes smaller because glutathione is being utilized as an antioxidant being converted to the oxidized form or GSSG. And when the redox becomes out of balance, this can affect cell signaling and function and influence the release of inflammatory cytokines. Our cells go through great lengths to maintain the redox balance because it's so important for the health of our cells. And this can be done in two ways, by de novo glutathione synthesis, or starting from the beginning, utilizing the amino acid building blocks, or we can utilize a salvage pathway and regenerate or recycle GSSG. Here are organ concentrations of glutathione in animals. Since glutathione is our natural cell protector, it is no coincidence it is highly concentrated in those organs most exposed to toxins and free radicals. With the liver having the highest concentration of glutathione, 
the next highest organ being the kidney, followed by the lung. The lung has a high concentration of glutathione because it's responsible for detoxifying many environmental toxins we inhale. The heart and brain have a high concentration of glutathione because of all the metabolic activity in these organs. And in humans, we would see a high concentration of glutathione in our skin, as well as the lens of our eyes, because glutathione protects against UV radiation, free radical damage. Our ability to detoxify and remove environmental toxins from the body is extremely important for our health. Many compounds that we're exposed to, like environmental chemicals and pollutants, even medications or drugs, these substances or compounds are not natural to the body and our body considers, considers them to be foreign, also known as xenobiotics. And we must have a way to remove or get rid of them, otherwise, they will, otherwise these compounds will quickly accumulate in our vital organs and cause toxicity and illness. The liver is primarily responsible for removing these xenobiotics, and it does this in two phases. The first phase of liver detoxification refers to the cytochrome P450 enzyme detoxification process. And these enzymes break down these compounds or xenobiotics by oxidizing them. The second phase takes the intermediates from phase one and converts them into water soluble conjugates. And it's these conjugates that will be eliminated through the kidneys and bile. The majority of environmental toxins are fat soluble. And phase two conjugation makes these compounds water soluble in order to support the removal of these fat soluble toxins from the body. Here's an illustration of phase two detoxification and specifically glutathione conjugation. As many of you may know, there are many different types of conjugation processes that are part of phase two detoxification. When we inhale and ingest toxic chemicals, drugs, and carcinogens, they will generally enter into phase one detoxification where they will be oxidized by the P450 enzymes, preparing them for phase two. When they enter into phase two, glutathione will actually attach to these toxic chemicals, drugs, and carcinogens with the help of the glutathione as transferase enzymes forming glutathione conjugates. These conjugates are water soluble, will be further broken down by the liver into smaller water soluble pieces. So these fat soluble toxins can be eliminated through the kidneys. The glutathione detoxification process is responsible for the removal of many environmental toxins we come in contact on a daily basis, preventing their accumulation and toxicity, but at the expense of glutathione as glutathione is lost through this process as glutathione conjugates. And this is one of many causes that can lead to glutathione depletion. Here's a short list of environmental chemicals that are detoxified by glutathione and their likely source of exposure. It is well known glutathione is a chelator of heavy metals, including mercury, lead, and cadmium. It's responsible for detoxifying many fat-soluble environmental chemicals, some of them carcinogens like benzene and benzopyranines that is found in smoke affluent. Also, it's responsible for detoxifying NAPQI, a toxic metabolite produced in acetaminophen or paracetamol overdose. And we'll talk about this next because it becomes important when we discuss the proof of concept study that demonstrated ribosine was effective in protecting the liver from this toxic metabolite. In the US, the Food and Drug Administration has been critical on the labeling of products that contain acetaminophen because they believe many consumers don't realize or are unaware that they're consuming acetaminophen in many of these combination products used to treat the common cold and flu. In fact, in the US, acetaminophen overdose is the leading cause of liver failure and accounts for over 50,000 emergency room visits annually. Here is the metabolic pathway for the removal of acetaminophen or paracetamol from the body after oral ingestion. 
at recommended doses, acetaminophen is non-toxic. It's safe for children and adults. It's a great pain reliever and can reduce fevers, as you know. And it's metabolized and eliminated by use of phase two detoxification only, forming water-soluble sulfate and glucuronic acid conjugates, which are eliminated through the urine. These conjugates are acidic, making them easier for the kidneys to remove. However, at high doses or overdose situation, both the sulfate and glucuronic acid conjugation pathways become overwhelmed or saturated. And the liver will attempt to remove acetaminophen by oxidizing it. Ironically, this produces a toxic and reactive metabolite known as NAPQI or NAPQI, which is very toxic to both the liver and the kidney because it binds to cellular proteins. Glutathione is responsible for detoxifying NAPQI through glutathione conjugation, again with the help of the glutathione S transferase enzymes, forming the acetaminophen mercaptic acid conjugate, which is water soluble and the detoxified product that is excreted into the urine. At high doses or overdose situations, liver glutathione will eventually get depleted. And we're no longer going to be able to detoxify this very toxic metabolite, NAPQI, by glutathione conjugation. And therefore, these individuals will develop liver damage. As some of you may know, the antidote for acetaminophen overdose that's going to be administered in the emergency room is intravenous N-acetylcysteine, or NAC, because it provides a rate-limiting amino acid, cysteine, so glutathione can be manufactured and continue to detoxify the NAPQ metabolite, preventing further liver damage. Glutathione is an immune system enhancer and protects our lymphocytes by neutralizing the oxidizing substances produced during infection. It's also needed for the growth, reproduction, and differentiation of both T and B lymphocytes. In a study published in Immunopharmacology, they found a direct relationship between the availability of glutathione and lymphocyte proliferation confirming the importance of intracellular glutathione in maintaining a healthy immune system. Glutathione and viral infections. With the COVID-19 pandemic, there have been a number of studies underway evaluating glutathione uh, and the precursors uh, for the coronavirus. For those of you interested in the status of these trials, you can access the website clinicaltrial.gov. In this particular study, uh, researchers at the prestigious Emory University School of Medicine measured the effects of glutathione on viral infections. Human airway epithelial cells were inoculated with the influenza virus, and these cells were cultured up to 72 hours in three different concentrations of glutathione. They found that glutathione significantly inhibited viral production especially at the higher concentrations of glutathione. These same researchers also studied the effects of glutathione on an influenza strain in mice. Four days after infection, the viral titer was measured and was significantly decreased in the lung and trachea in the animals that were treated with glutathione. And this decrease in viral titer was shown to be statistically significant. The authors concluded that the results suggest glutathione may provide an alternative strategy to limiting the influenza infection. Here is a study uh, that was published in the British journal Lancet on the relationship between glutathione and our health. This study evaluated four groups of individuals, 66 young healthy volunteers with a mean age in their mid-20s, 58 healthy elderly, by definition, they had no major medical problems in the last five years and were on no medications. Then we had 
49 uh, elderly outpatients that were diagnosed to have a chronic disease and were being followed up in an outpatient clinic for management. And the final group were 47 elderly inpatients, all recently admitted to the hospital for an acute illness. The authors measured a marker for oxidative stress, in this case, lipid hydroperoxide. And you would expect this marker to increase in oxidative stress. And they also evaluated glutathione levels. They reported that glutathione levels decrease with age 0.54 to 0.29 in your healthy elderly. And their glutathione levels also decrease as their health declined. They also found that the marker for oxidative stress significantly increased from 3.14 to 8.84 in the elderly inpatient admitted for an acute illness, indicating significant cellular oxidative stress in these hospitalized patients. Here's a study that was published in Carcinogenesis on the relationship between glutathione levels and age. They measured blood glutathione levels in three different age groups, 20 to 40, 40 to 60, and 60 to 80 for both males and females. And they found that glutathione levels decrease with increasing age, regardless of gender. And the reason for this decrease, the first enzyme responsible for glutathione production, glutamate cysteine ligase, becomes less efficient as we age and therefore less glutathione is produced. There are many causes that deplete our glutathione levels, which is a rationale for supplementation. As I mentioned, exposure to environmental toxins and pollutants, their removal and detoxification through the glutathione detoxification pathway can lead to glutathione depletion. In addition, the many causes related to free radical formation can lower our glutathione levels, including getting older. So these are all good reasons why we need to consider glutathione supplementation in order to maintain optimal glutathione levels. In June of this year, uh, in the prestigious Journal of Infectious Disease, a publication of the American Chemical Society, the author suggests that the deficiency of endogenous glutathione is the underlying cause of serious illness and death in the elderly COVID-19 patients. Specifically, in the elderly, there are age-related and disease-related impaired redox homeostasis and associated oxidative stress which contributes to the more severe outcomes. He mentions this decline in glutathione with age and points out that many of these individuals also have chronic diseases associated with low glutathione levels. Anybody interested in reading this paper can access the ACS journal website. The need to increase glutathione levels through supplementation led to ribosine development. As I mentioned earlier, there are over 150,000 published studies on glutathione. Most of them focus on glutathione's role as a cell protector, with very few researchers directed on the delivery of glutathione. Dr. Herbert Nagasawa happened to be an exception. As a professor of medicinal chemistry and toxicology at the University of Minnesota, he recognized the need to maintain optimal glutathione levels but also the limitations of the dietary supplements, glutathione and cysteine, and therefore targeted his research to overcome the bioavailability issues inherent to glutathione supplementation. Many of the 186 peer-reviewed publications by Dr. Nagasawa were focused on better delivery methods to improve endogenous glutathione. He happened to also be a senior career research scientist at the VA Medical Center. His laboratories were considered to be experts in glutathione chemistry and dedicated over 25 years of research to improve and develop better dietary supplements to support the natural production of glutathione. Dr. Nagasawa's interest in glutathione began in the early 1980s. As a scientist for the VA Medical Center, he focused his research on ailments that afflicted the hospitalized veteran and his concern was the high incidence of alcohol abuse amongst the veterans, with many of them admitted to the hospital for the treatment of alcohol liver disease. It was observed that individuals with alcohol liver disease 
had low liver glutathione levels. So research focused on the improvement of liver glutathione in hopes this would prevent the progression of this disease. It was also known that individuals that chronically abuse alcohol had poor dietary habits and they would often binge drink where alcohol becomes a substitute for food. And therefore they were not consuming the necessary amino acids or proteins that the body requires to produce sufficient glutathione. Dr. Nagasawa strongly believed if he could provide these veterans with an effective dietary supplement that would support the natural production of glutathione, you could prevent individuals with alcohol liver disease progressing into a much more serious condition known as alcohol liver cirrhosis, which is irreversible and will eventually lead to death without a liver transplant. Since cysteine is a rate limiting amino acid for the production of glutathione, to deliver it orally would require a bioavailable form. The challenge was to protect this amino acid during the absorption phase in order to minimize its breakdown so it could be utilized to support the natural production of glutathione. As a medicinal chemist, Dr. Nagasawa was convinced if he could protect the fragile sulfhydro group on cysteine, this would significantly improve its bioavailability and would be the solution to the problem. They accomplished this by attaching a natural sugar to cysteine, and the sugar happened to be ribose, a common sugar found in the body which is utilized to manufacture ATP. Ribose is a sugar aldehyde, or what we call a reducing sugar, and will spontaneously condense to the amino acid cysteine to form ribosine, fully protecting that fragile sulfhydro group, improving cysteine's bioavailability. And once in total body water, will non-enzymatically rehydrate into its two natural components, ribose and cysteine where ribose can support ATP production and cysteine can be incorporated into the glutathione production pathway. The technology appears simple, but it actually took thousands of dedicated research hours by many different disciplines, including biochemists, organic chemists, pharmacologists, and medicinal chemists that ultimately led to ribosine's development and ribosine's effectiveness in improving glutathione levels has been published in many peer-reviewed journals. How was ribosine tested? It showed that it was effective in raising glutathione levels. So let's discuss the studies that were conducted and published on ribosine that demonstrated it was effective in increasing glutathione by starting with the research hypothesis. What was known was individuals that chronically abused alcohol had low liver glutathione levels. And this decrease in glutathione increases oxidative stress in the liver, which will then cause liver damage. This is another very important concept. In chronic alcohol abuse, liver glutathione is decreased. Therefore, the liver no longer has enough antioxidants to neutralize the damaging free radicals that are being produced. This will result in the liver being in a state of chronic oxidative stress. And over the years, these individuals will develop alcohol liver disease. The key question was, can you prevent liver damage due to chronic alcohol abuse by replenishing liver glutathione? In other words, could a bioavailable cysteine supplement increase liver glutathione which will result in a decrease in liver oxidative stress by reestablishing this critical balance between the free radicals and antioxidants by increasing liver glutathione. If so, this could be an effective way to prevent liver damage from occurring. So how was ribosine tested to show that it actually worked? If we assume that ribosine can effectively increase liver glutathione, we should be able to demonstrate that it can prevent liver damage based on its ability to decrease oxidative stress by reestablishing the balance between the free radicals and antioxidants. In order to demonstrate this, 
they needed to have a valid model to test their hypothesis in. Testing this hypothesis in a human clinical trial would be cost prohibitive since the damage to the liver due to chronic alcohol abuse occurs over decades of life and to demonstrate ribosine's protective effect over such a long period of time becomes impractical. So it requires an animal model, generally a mouse model that can mimic liver damage caused by chronic oxidative stress or mimics liver damage caused by chronic depletion of liver glutathione. Dr. Nagasawa created a model where the animal was put in an environment of oxidative stress that severely depleted the liver glutathione, resulting in liver damage similar to alcohol liver disease, and then administered ribosine to observe whether it would protect the animal from liver damage due to severely depleting their liver glutathione. The animal model used to mimic alcohol liver disease administered a high dose of acetaminophen to these animals. As we discussed, extremely high doses of acetaminophen will deplete liver glutathione and will cause liver damage that happens to be very similar to what's seen in alcohol liver disease. So giving high dose acetaminophen becomes a very good short-term model that can be used by researchers to mimic liver damage caused by oxidative stress or chronic alcohol abuse. This model allowed Dr. Nagasawa to screen many compounds that had a high probability to increase liver glutathione and could compare them and rank them for their efficacy. These studies could be completed over several months as opposed to years or decades and is an acceptable model in the scientific community to mimic liver damage caused by oxidative stress, or an acceptable model to mimic alcohol liver disease. Here is the first study that was published on ribosine. This was an animal model that evaluated a compound's ability to protect the animal against liver damage from a toxic dose of acetaminophen. This study tested nine compounds all known to have varying degrees of elevating glutathione levels and included ribosine and N-acetylcysteine, or NAC. They found that ribosine was the only compound tested where no mice died during the study. It was the only compound which showed no significant liver damage due to high dose acetaminophen. All other compounds tested, which included NAC, unfortunately had animal deaths due to significant liver damage. This study demonstrated that ribosine can protect the liver from a toxic dose of acetaminophen by effectively increasing liver glutathione. And it did so better than all the other compounds it was tested against. Here's a summary of the study findings the animals that were administered only a very high dose of acetaminophen. Out of the 12 animals in this group, only two survived at 48 hours, or a 17% survival rate. Post-mortem, 11 of those animals had severe or four plus necrosis of the liver. The animals that were given NAC with a toxic dose of acetaminophen had a 94% survival rate at 48 hours, with two of the animals having significant liver damage, exhibiting three and four plus necrosis of the liver. The animals that received ribosine shortly after a toxic dose of acetaminophen had a 100% survival rate at 48 hours, and no animals were noted to have severe liver damage. In this published study, when ribosine was compared to NAC and their ability to increase liver cell glutathione, ribosine clearly outperformed NAC. Here is some data from the study. You can see that even when two and a half times more NAC was given, the glutathione levels were 30% lower than they were with ribosine. Another way of looking at it Ribosine was at least 300% more effective in raising liver glutathione than NAC was in this liver cell system. Ribosine was not only shown to increase liver glutathione, but was also able to restore depleted glutathione 
in many other organs. Incidentally, this type of study cannot be done in the humans because it requires the biopsies of the different organs. So the best way to study the effects of ribosine in the different organs is through the use of an animal model. In this animal model, the mice were put in an environment of oxidative stress, depleting glutathione in their various organs. They evaluated a number of the animal's organs, but because of the limited space of the slide, selected four key organs, the kidney, the lung, muscle, and heart. On your left is the measured glutathione levels in these organs. The green bar represents the animals with normal glutathione. The black is the glutathione levels in the animals in oxidative stress or depleted glutathione levels. And the gray bar are the animals in oxidative stress but were also given ribosine. As you can see, ribosine was able to restore organ glutathione levels back to normal in these very key organs. The ribosine technology was issued a U.S. patent in 2013. The title of the patent is a method to enhance the delivery of glutathione and ATP levels in cells. I think the title says it all. This technology is proprietary to Max International. There are currently 32 peer-reviewed published studies on ribosine. These studies were conducted over a period of 30 plus years. The first proof of concept study that we covered was published in 1987 where ribosine demonstrated it could protect against a toxic dose of acetaminophen by raising liver glutathione levels. This was a pivotal study because ribosine showed such good protection, the National Institutes of Health continued to fund ribosine research because they felt it was worthy of further study. It's important to point out that these 32 published studies were not funded by Max International, but rather by the National Institutes of Health and other governmental agencies, including universities. There have been nine published studies since 2017, with three published studies already this year. There were two published studies on cardiovascular health conducted by Dr. Sally McCormick from the University of Otago, New Zealand, one using human lipoprotein A, transgenic mice, and the other using APOE deficient mice. Since these two studies had very positive results, she was able to obtain funding from a research foundation to initiate a human clinical trial to determine if this preclinical data will translate to humans. We anticipate that this study will be completed later this year. There have been recent published studies that investigate the effectiveness of ribosine in chronic diseases that are associated with oxidative stress, such as male fertility, diabetes, and Alzheimer's. These studies utilize the most advanced animal models, and I'm excited to report that these results were once again very positive. I encourage each of you to log on to the MAX website to get the reference or PubMed to review the study yourself. Please stay safe and healthy, and thank you very much. Thank you, Scott. I always appreciate your lectures and have taken pages of notes, as I always do. Uh, for our medical and health professionals, as with Dr. Smith's presentation, the bibliography I have compiled for you will contain all of the studies cited in Dr. Nagasawa's presentation. If our medical and health professionals have questions, for either Dr. Smith or Dr. Nagasawa, please submit those to me at the following email address, ribose, R-I-B-O-S-E, cysteine, C-Y-S-T-E-I-N-E, -E, at max.com. Again, that is ribose, cysteine, at max.com. Our host for this medical symposium was Max International, a company devoted to global education on clinically proven nutritional science. It is now my pleasure to introduce Mr. Joseph Wojtyki, the CEO of Max International, for his closing remarks and a special announcement for the medical and health professionals in attendance today. Joe was instrumental in the ribosine technology being acquired by Max International in 2009. Please help me welcome Mr. Joseph Wojtyki. Joe? Thank you, Bobby. And thank you, Dr. Margie Smith and Dr. Scott Nagasawa for your wonderful presentations in this symposium. Uh, we appreciate your dedication to excellent science 
and your great explanations to the science behind ribocene and glutathione. What I have seen throughout the world since I joined Max International in 2009 is the importance of excellent science. And Dr. Herbert Nagasawa, by inventing ribocene and wanting to share the importance of glutathione around the world, has had a tremendous impact on so many people in so many different countries. Science and its quality and thorough research is very, very important at Max International. We've developed a, a portal for medical and healthcare professionals so that they can have a one-stop location to learn about ribocene and glutathione. These resources will be of great importance for you as you explain glutathione to your patients and those that you encounter. The healthcare professional portal is ribocysteine.com. We also want all of your questions to be answered. So please send your questions to ribocysteine at max.com. We also would really appreciate your feedback about this medical symposium and topics that may be of interest to you for future symposiums. So please get back to the person who invited you to today's presentation to share your ideas. We want to thank you for your time coming in to see the science behind ribocene and glutathione. We look forward to seeing all of you again in the near future. And be assured that Max's commitment to science is following the vision of Dr. Herbert P. Nagasawa. We will always give our best to present excellent science, the highest quality products, and we want to educate and share that science with medical professionals around the world. Thank you very much. Look forward to seeing you again at the next medical symposium.